Thanks for joining. We're going to go ahead and get started with the session. I uh, hope you're in the right room. We are talking about bringing traditional and on-premise workflows to the cloud and Earth Engine, or how do you mix Earth Engine with almost anything that you've been doing prior to working in Earth Engine. Um, so I'm, I'm Kel Markert. I'm a uh, Google Cloud customer engineer. Uh, I specialize in geospatial uh, workflows. And so basically, my role is helping work with customers to get on board with Earth Engine and bring their geospatial applications into the cloud. Hey, uh, I'm Jeremy Malchek, uh, also a customer engineer. We call ourselves cloud geographers because uh, we're working with maps in the cloud, but that gets a bit confusing when we're talking to people externally, but it's a nice title and I'm, I'm going to run with it. Um, so uh, my background is more in software engineering, building uh, applications on top of uh, Earth Engine and services like Earth Engine, also building services that are like that, that are similar to Earth Engine. So I have, have a bit of a, an understanding of, of the plumbing underneath and some of the challenges that, that people face trying to work with this stuff. Um, yeah, uh, real, real quick before we dive in, uh, there's the link to the slides. There's, uh, the slides can also be accessed through the agenda as well. There's a couple links in the slides. So um, if yeah. you're going to follow along, we have hands-on session today as well where you're, you're going to get your uh, roll up your sleeves, get into our cloud platform and, and run some stuff. So if you want to do that, just grab the slides and we can click through some links and stuff. Yeah, so we're going to try to get through just sort of background and get to the meat of it and, and get you guys, get your hands dirty. Um, and so just broadly what we're covering here, you know, the why, why, <clears throat> why you want to bring things to the cloud. Most people kind of have a general sense here coming to this conference, but we'll, we'll summarize that a bit. What we mean by when we talk about a traditional workflow, because tradition means things, different things to different people. Um, and I guess tradition is changing a bit, but we're gonna, I'm going to go reach into my distant past um, working on uh, bare metal in, in the basements of uh, academia and, and for the private sector. Um, and then how we, we can kind of run, take those things that, we, that, that maybe still work on physical hardware and, and, and bring them to the cloud and sort of lift and shift them in, into, um, into the services we provide here. Uh, go over a few of the, few of the caveats that, that, that you might want to keep in mind when you're working with a service like Earth Engine. Um, cause, uh, just because you can connect something uh, doesn't always mean you should. Um, and then we're going to use this thing called uh, D-I-N-E-O-F. I keep calling it DINEOF, but I don't think that's how it's pronounced. Um, <clears throat> so if anybody has, knows the proper pronunciation, please speak up. Um, as an example of something we, we can use here, it's a gap-filling algorithm. Um, we'll plumb it all together in this quick lab uh, environment that we're going to give you uh, access to, which is a complete, uh, fully contained uh, GCP environment where you can run amok and, and, and implement something like this. You can actually do a whole lot of other things uh, once you have access to it. It only runs for three hours, so if you're going to mine Bitcoin, do it quickly. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then we'll just wrap up with Q&A. And, uh, and, and it, it, this is intended to be a pretty freeform uh, session, so please interrupt us, raise hands, and uh, keep it conversational. Yeah, um, more links. Yeah, so b before we get started, because it is a the the Quick Labs environment will spin up your own student environment on on cloud and stuff. Uh, we need to get your emails to add to the lab. So uh, we have this survey here. Uh, there's a short link, but also a QR code. Uh, there's there's a few other questions on there, but the main thing is, I think the only thing that's required is that you give your email because we need that, so that way we can register you on the on the lab. Once you've done the survey and given us your email, go to ce.quicklabs.com and register with that same email you just gave in there. There should be a, a, a link on the top right. And then we'll go in while we're going through the slides. Uh, we have Ben and John back there doing TAing. They will add you to the lab, and you'll have access to that once we get to the hands-on se section. Uh, so we'll pause here for a second, take a s snapshot of it, or go to there. We'll, we also have the Quick Labs links uh, throughout the slides, and so we go back to them. 
Everybody get a picture? Needs it? You're gonna come back to this, but um, I think we're good. Okay, we're good. Cool. All right, why cloud? Um, you know, we, we, why we want to fix something that works uh, isn't broken. Uh, so, coming from my previous life working in academia, um, we there was a, a number of like scripts and R our packages and uh, you know, executables that people would be running uh, on on bare metal in the, in this in in that in that lab environment and and we found that I found uh, as someone who was tasked with maintaining that as as people would come and go that uh, you know this the maintaining maintaining a, a system that's 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 passed on to you and an infrastructure. Um, and being able to grow that thing uh, was was a constant challenge. Um, so for maintenance, scale, and cost, those are the, the, the three things that, that that the cloud really can can help you with. Um, and you know that was what the cloud was built for, right? So uh, these these sort of um, needs that are growing, costs that are growing, new capabilities. Um, in in as as the, as the needs of a um, of an organization change right so uh, traditional infrastructure is really built to uh, for a for a specific um, task and a uh, you, you would you would you would size your infrastructure plan your scale and you didn't have a whole lot of flexibility right so it wasn't very good for these intermittent workloads. Which is common with with remote sensing, you know, so, some, something is happening in a growing season. You want to respond to that, do an analysis, and go on your way. Uh, with the with with traditional infrastructure that you're you're building and maintaining on on site, you you need to. It's difficult to plan for that. You can't just make it go away. So these 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 bursts, um, it's it's hard to, to handle growth. Um, one of my early uh, jobs, working for um, we were we were building something similar to Google Earth for. Um, or Google Maps for topographic mapping at the time that was like a big deal to have like an entire country mapped on the web um, and we built it all physically in a data center we'd go and 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 we'd have to manage getting in and out of this place the the physical access um, you know there was like an eyeball scanner there that got us in that was that, that was really like cutting edge at the time but it was it was hard you know you had to like move people around so just remember where we were and and where we're at now and, and and how much easier a lot of this stuff is but there's there's still a lot of these processes that exist in in these silos uh, and we're thinking mostly about these these uh, research labs and and companies that have, have, have built things that um, are still functional but they realize they want to break them out into the cloud and and make it make it scale make it more maintainable um, so cloud lets you scale and use capacity uh, for for what you use, right? So it's more of like a, a rent uh, rent versus buy model, which uh, in traditional finance generally you, is the reverse of what you want to do. But when it comes to maintaining infrastructure that's going to depreciate over time, it's generally a better um, strategy, uh, especially if you you don't necessarily need. That scale all the time. Like why, why, why build a supercomputer when you're only going to use it three days a year? And when it comes to remote sensing, this is like really a, particularly appropriate. Everyone knows this. We're here for Earth Engine because this this is this is abstracted away a lot of the problems that remote sensing brings to those environments. Like you're you're never going to really be able to ingest these petabytes of imagery into a in an on-site uh, data center. Uh, you can try. People do try to do it, um, but it gets very expensive to do that uh, on on your own physical infrastructure. Um, even if you're somebody like NASA, uh, and 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 for 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 an individual that 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 doesn't have have access to that, it really kind of limits you. So so this is why we go to the cloud. Um, this is a this is a chart that Kel dropped in here that illustrates the the sort of projected growth of uh, imagery uh, and that, that pink uh, section there is, are all the new missions that have been added um, over time. So it's just growing exponentially and we just 
uh, we need systems like this to, to scale out horizontally and, and handle that load. And because it's happening at a time that the cloud itself is, is adding capacity and, and leveraging these economies of scale to, to add capacity, um, it, it's kind of convenient because those, the cost of the, that storage is, 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 is coming down. So, so we, can, we, we, can, we can use the, the scale of Google to, to solve the problem for you. So we all know that. Just wanted to level set why we're doing this. Now, what do we mean by traditional? This is the oldest looking slide that we could find internally at Google. I, I, I was just like, give me a picture of something horrible from my past, and here it is. Um, it gets pretty close to the, 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 the present day with some, uh, I think that's like an iPhone 4 or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot happens on the right, but like, you know, there's still a lot of this happening. Uh, there's still a lot, a lot of work in the world is being done on, on physical infrastructure, and it is, there's a barrier to bringing that to the cloud, and we want to we wanna break down uh, what that means, right? So we came from giant mainframes with tape drives, and there's still quite a bit of remote sensing imagery that lives on media like that. Um, we, we, we migrated to you know, machines that we could bring into our, our, uh, our own personal spaces in the, the 90s. That's really not that long ago. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers the first machine they got. There's probably some people that can um, date myself with the, uh, I think it was an Apple IIe um, that we had. Like a, one of those giant disk, floppy disk drives. I mean, that's really not that long. Well, I guess it was a long time ago. Maybe not for you, Kel. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, then we moved to these private clouds. This is this is where I kind of cut my teeth building those, um, building geospatial infrastructure for the for the topographic mapping um, site. Uh, so that was like uh, I think we had 20 terabytes of data, and it was just <clears throat> mind blown. 20 terabytes on this on this this stack of servers um, in the Hood Milk Factory in Boston. Um, and, and, and then to today, right, where we have this public cloud where we don't think about any of that stuff. Um, some do that have, like, very strict security requirements where they need to ag air gap it from, uh, from the public, but there's, it's, it's usually the last option. And so there's still a lot of that happening in, in academia. Um, are still in that mid-2000s era, um, and we want to show you how you can uh, bring that into into the server, into into the into more modern infrastructure on the on the, on, on the public cloud. Um, so, it's also good to kind of remind ourselves like what are the things that we're emulating here in the cloud, right? So, CPUs, processing units, um, RAM, uh, quick quick access memory that 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 the that your your processes are are using and throwing away constantly. Uh, persistent storage, so that would be hard drives and SSDs in, in your physical media on your machines here, but those are those are re replicated by different types of services in the cloud. So we're picking apart all these little components of physical computing um, that we carry around in our pockets and, and, and in our laptops, but we're emulating that in different ways in the cloud. Um, and and when it comes to doing big jobs um, for the tr traditional high performance computing environment that some of, the, of our uh, public sector customers here may also have access to. Um, you know, we're talking about these big monolithic infrastructures, still big investments going into um, creating machinery um, that, that, that is managed by, by your organization and, and how that parallelism is ha handled and, and shared is a bit different than it works in the cloud. It's more of like a uh, you're, you're building out a, a single big machine. You can think of it more like a big machine when you're when you're inter interacting with it, which is why it's more pro a little easier to use these older um, ways of um, solving. Pro or older software will will generally live in those those systems a little bit uh, more naturally than it does in the cloud. You're sharing resources and, and scheduling, ske scheduling jobs, and, and it's it's more of a um, a shared environment than uh, GCP, where resources can be spooled up for you and and 
and scaled out horizontally. When we say horizontal scaling, that's that, that means you're adding capacity next door to um, to where you're running instead of building a bigger machine. Uh, and you can do both in the cloud, but it's generally best suited for things that will scale horizontally, easier to do. Okay, so how do we do this? Why are we? What is the the nuts and bolts of it? So for when we're talking about traditional. This is our definition of traditional. Um, we've got this smoking server in the corner here. Uh, I keep getting reminded of my last gig uh, where I was working on Earth Engine at uh, Yale University on the Map of Life project that they touched on yesterday, um, where we had bought this giant coffin. It looked a lot like a coffin. Um, it had a stack of servers in there, uh, and they spent like 20 grand on this thing. It just and it sat in the corner of our conference room and just generated heat and noise and frustration. And it looked a little bit like this. I couldn't get a picture of it for this, for this talk. I pinged a bunch of people to take a picture of that thing because it's still running. Somebody, somebody's job is to, to keep it going, and I know uh, they're, 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 they're looking for a new role like daily every time they interact with that thing. Um, so that is infrastructure you control, you own or control. So it's software you install on a machine that you have control over. Maybe it's a virtual machine. That's pretty traditional too now. Um, it's not cloud optimized. It doesn't have, it's not, it's not a, using storage that is optimized for um, the kinds of reads and, and fetching patterns that you would use in a service like uh, cloud storage or a blob store. It's doing, using patterns that maybe rely on everything being there in, in that, uh, that single unit. You can control it via some kind of user interface or a command line interface. Maybe it has an API. Maybe you're doing some low-level coding with it. Um, it's, it's really flexible in that capacity. Um, but uh, it could even be a, a, a piece of software where you, you don't have a whole lot of, um, you know, it's just an executable uh, with a few different levers that you can pull. So that's what we have. This is the sort of the spectrum of things that we're going to bring it into. We have our, our options and just how it lives in, in, in Google's infrastructure. Um, so at the very base level, we have that bare metal stuff managed by people who are way better than, it, than any of us will be um, or want to be. And then we build this virtualization layer on top of it that abstracts away those things into different types of components of compute uh, that that that's, that our software can can um, can understand. So these are you can think of these virtual machines as 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 best in class kind of uh, con containers of of computing power that mimic what you would be able to install as physical um, as physical physical infrastructure. And then we containerize on top of that. So give you ways to package your package your code and your applications into environments that are repeatable, replicatable, um, and, and that gives us a, a, lot of, a lot of more power to uh, scale and orchestrate how that scale happens on top of the, the virtualization uh, the, the cloud provides. And then above that, we get um, our, our application platforms that we can sort of do more sophisticated work from and, and abstract away even more of that uh, complexity and, and provide uh, serverless kind of functionality, so we, uh, cloud functions and cloud run is is sort of where you, you can just focus on the bits of code and let everything else kind of run, and finally to the user. So we talked about containers. Containers is, and we're gonna we're gonna do that in this. We're gonna use those in this exercise. Containers are packages of software that contain all of the necessary elements to run in any environment, um, and those environments can be different from. Um, you, know, you get to define what that environment looks like. Um, that means it gives you portability, so you can create this thing, uh, stamp out the container, uh, and and bring it to somewhere else that can run it. Uh, it. It decouples you from the cloud. It gives you, it allows you, it gives you the flexibility to run in any places where that can implement that environment, which is a lot lot easier to do than um, moving something physical or chaining yourself to uh, a service that only runs in a, in a, in a, in a given cloud. Um, so that, 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 gives you, that gives you flexibility, but sometimes you want to plumb into uh, services that, that extract away even more of the pain, like Earth Engine. and give you access to uh, uh, larger data sets, more compute capacity, f flexibility, and such. Um, 
And yeah, and so you, like I mentioned, you can, you can deploy this to lots of cloud services. These are our cloud services. There are other cloud services out there. Um, containerization is, is, is really something that's it's pretty um, widespread and uh, being adopted by lots of um, companies to, to abstract away this work. Uh, and so in GCP, the tooling that we're going to talk, we're going to speak to here, um, and, and sort of the, the breadth of, of serverless options that you have to um, work with those containers and, 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 and process the, you know, run them and process the outputs of it, um, we have on the, uh, the, for our serverless function, um, APIs, cloud functions, and cloud run, that's kind of the, the most abstracted where you can take a piece of software that runs on a container, take some inputs and put some and, and, and generate some outputs uh, and not worry about how, how that kind of scales behind the scenes. That's what we're going to be working with in the, in the exercise in, coming up in a little bit. We have uh, orchestration um, APIs that can can chain those and um, and work with those uh, that the functionality in those containers to process large amounts of data, so run lots of, of jobs to um, asynchronously process big batches of data, so cloud data flow and data proc are examples of that. There's cloud storage, so serverless, I talked about blob storage, this is just like a, a key value store where you can think of it as a giant um, FTP server is at, its, at its core. It, it's a, it maybe not the greatest analogy, but a file path and a file after it. There's subtleties in how that works that uh, that allow you to kind of leverage some functionality that in fetching the data to, uh, that's when we talk about cloud optimization uh, that, that lets you take advantage of features specifically for, for geospatial data um, when you store them there. So HTTP range requests lets you get a little piece of a file instead of getting the whole file so you can, you can kind of break things into smaller and smaller pieces. And then our analysis, um, analysis APIs, BigQuery, the data warehouse for, for tabular data, uh, data proc, and, and, and Hadoop, all these sort of like uh, analytics toolkits. Yeah, yeah and uh, one, one thing I want to mention about this too, right? So when you're, when you're working in traditional environments like HPC systems or university clusters, things like that, like someone's managing the resources, you have to manage the parallelization and things within your software and stuff. You still have to do that a little bit uh, and like how you structure your software to, to take advantage of parallelization in cloud. But all of that infrastructure to do the parallelization is abstracted away and Google Cloud handles all of that for you. So you're, you're left more with how do I actually want to do this thing versus having to manage all those things? How do I connect these pieces of hardware together and, and, and things like that? Yeah, so what we're gonna go through here and we're gonna try to point out is, is, is how you break up that problem and, and what services you wanna use here. So these, this is kind of the, the, the general portfolio of, of things that we're building on right now. Where does Earth Engine fit in? Um, so we all know Earth Engine's strengths. It's it is totally managed as a SaaS platform, software as a service. You don't get to see really any of the guts behind it. Um, so no installation, no management. All compute and storage is, is is handled for you. You're asking question. You're bringing the question to the data. Uh, we're scaling it and we're returning that. So we got this deep catalog. I think we're actually close to 100 petabytes now. This slide is always changing. I gotta keep keep up with it. Um, it's got a super flexible API uh, to a point, right? We know it, you get to the edge of what it can do, and that's why we're doing this today, right? Like, there are some things that won't work inside of Earth Engine and probably shouldn't work inside of Earth Engine. So, but many things can be fed by it, and many things can feed it, and that's what we're intending to enable you with here. Uh, you can control it from the user interface, our, our code ed editor that everyone's familiar with, the new Python tools, um, the uh, client library, uh, sorry, the uh, command line interface, uh, the Python JavaScript libraries, or the REST API. So super flexible. Can, the, the idea is that we, we want to enable you to plug this into any environment. We want to meet you where you sit. And so this is the sort of typical pipeline we're, processing pipeline we're 
we're targeting here. Uh, so you're coming from this raw data, data lake type environment where you may have assembled imagery from um, outside sources. Uh, it, could, it could be other FTP servers, um, unstructured sort of pile of stuff, uh, Landsat scenes, whatever, you know, not, you don't have that, that Earth Engine organization and structure up applied to it already. Uh, then a, a, a data warehouse where you refine that into some structure and have some ability to do uh, processing on it. So you're, you're iterating and creating more and more refined data over on the right here, which lands in, um, in, a, in a structured and scalable place where you can access from, you know, share it with, with outside sources. Your, your API backends that might be feeding some kind of application or all the sort of downstream value that you're trying to pull from it. So this is the kind of the typical like ugly to pretty. Well, I guess everybody, some people might find the, the all of it pretty, but it gets pretty ugly. And, <laughs> yeah, and the, and the point of this, this is this is very general, right? To like substitute whatever you're trying to do here, right? I mean, you, you start with data, you process some data, you have some results, you either reuse those results or share those results or have them in a web application or you know have those results somewhere, right? And so whatever that is. Um, yeah, you want to talk about cloud? Yeah, so this is kind of where we see ourselves flip, fitting in here. So um, your, those raw outside sources, uh, they, they could be uh, landing in, in GCP on, on just raw storage. Um, but they could be coming from external sources into some kind of data warehousing system. Um, Earth Engine is kind of like a data warehouse itself. It does this, it does both kinds of, of processing, but for, re for remote sensing data, you can think of a data warehouse that has put some structure on the data. It enables you to do interactive and uh, batch style analysis on it. And then um, iterate on that through um, through these processes that we're that we're, we're talking about now, the uh, external processes that we're bringing in the cloud, maybe Vertex AI plugging in to apply some machine learning to to the data that's that's living in Earth Engine, um, and, and creating these refined outputs that you then kind of share out. So uh, those API backends or the, the the refined data could be accessed through lots of different ways, just depending on on the access pattern that you're you're after. Like maybe you have uh, some sort of application, user facing application. You want that to be really fast and quick response times as people interact with it. Um, so you, you might want to have uh, lightweight cloud functions that can access uh, data in a, in a place that can respond really quickly and, um, and have some kind of front end that, that brings all that business logic together, um, overlays it on a map, allows that sort of interactivity. The sort of things that you saw with the land cover monitoring system yesterday. Okay. And, and I, I want to add here too, right? So. You, you, we have some icons on like cloud services, right? Like cloud storage, cloud run, cloud functions, Vertex AI, Earth Engine. It's not to say that Earth Engine should be used in all those points. It's to say that Earth Engine can be used at those specific steps, right? So depending on what you're trying to do, you may pick and choose between storing your data in cloud storage and then pulling it into Earth Engine or you know, having data in Earth Engine and pulling it into Cloud Run or some other things like that, right? So uh, the, the whole point of this is just to illustrate that Earth Engine fits at different places and you can pick and choose the functionality of Earth Engine depending on your application. Okay, debated on whether or not to have this slide here, but there are things that you should do and things you should not do. Um, and you'll do all of them over the course of a career. That's how we learn as That's humans. That's how we learn as humans, right? You got to get burned. Although my pyromaniac son is yet to learn. The hot hurts. I'm staying out of that one. Yeah. I will, I, I will advise anyone who has children to opt for the accident insurance plan. It pays dividends. Um, Anyway, so avoid layering parallelism on top of parallelism. What does that mean? It means like if you have a system that allows you to scale out and fan out, try to avoid having the things that those, those, those that scale does, all those individual workers. So you have a, a discrete piece of work that you want these things to do. If that discrete piece of work is calling some other service that does the same thing, 
you're you're creating an infinite like compute like fan out. It can it can it can you can get you can you can cause problems that way, and very strange things can happen. And because Earth Engine al allows you to scale out, you don't really see how that scaling is happening. Sometimes when you call it at high concurrency, so many many times at once, you can you can you can get into this pattern of layering parallelism on top of it. So try to bundle your operations into a single Earth Engine request. Make make it do as much as you can in a single task. Those can run quite a long time, um, but don't like make thousands and thousands of tasks or write something that's going to hit the batch API um, at a high concurrency. You're just going to make a mess. Um, remember that idle computers cost money. You know, they're, all of these services have rate and concurrency limits. So a rate is a request per time. How many questions can we ask in a unit of time? Um, or a concurrency limit. So how many you have at once. So our, our high volume API, I believe, has a 1,000 um, concurrent request limit that can effectively cause a rate limit uh, because those requests have some kind of latency to them that varies but that's the limit you're working under so if you have something that that needs more than that or can can launch more than that don't do that right because if you're if you have if, if you're spinning up computers that have to wait on earth engine to give an answer you're paying for those things to be alive, and we want to avoid that. Um, and then, and then, lastly, just start small and scale up. Right, this is a pattern that you see in remote sensing a lot. Uh, work on a small patch, and and figure out how that works, what the resources it's consuming are, and then usually you can kind of scale that out linearly in space and time. There's caveats to that too, right? Because the the way the data sits may not be uniform, but that's a, that's a common approach, and it's, it's generally better to do that than just launching something globally, because um, nobody ever does that. The, the other thing that uh, you should avoid is in your par parallel process, kick off a batch task that takes a long time to run and wait for that thing to run. Yeah, so, people uh, do that. Yeah, the online, if you're, if you're doing parallelism on Google Cloud and, and handling that, through Google Cloud, your the online stack with Earth Engine is your friend there. All right, I've gone over my time. You were supposed to keep me honest. Um, I just like listening to you talk. <laughs> All right, um, so so now that we've gone through and, and talked about a lot of the, um, the cloud, the infrastructure, why you would want to use cloud, and, and, and how like some of the cloud services and where Earth Engine fits in and everything, we wanted to walk through a, a very specific example of a, a process that does not fit in Earth Engine. Earth Engine does a great job at computing per pixel things, uh, does a great job at like neighborhood, very finite operations uh, where you know the bounds that you're working with. It does not do well with iterations. If you want to run something that depends on the previous step, uh, Earth Engine does not do well, right? So like hydrologic modeling, or if you want to uh, work with something that Earth Engine doesn't know the bounds of compute, like flow modeling, you need to see where water is flowing to and everything. Sorry, I have a lot of hydrology uh, examples because my training is in hydrology. Um, but you, so, so those kind of patterns don't fit well with Earth Engine. But Earth Engine has tremendous value in the amount of data that we have and being able to get that data into something that you actually want to process, right? And so this example, the uh, DINEOF, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it either. Dinioff. Din, din, okay, well, well, we're going with Jeremy's uh, Dinioff. Make it a thing, make, make it a thing, okay, all right. Dinioff is a thing now. Um, it, it stands for data interpolation, and uh, data interpolating in empirical orthogonal functions. And so, fancy way of saying it, um, you're doing data interpolation or gap filling. And, and the way you do that, uh, th there's a method called empirical orthogonal functions. Don't, don't get scared. It, it's a fancy way of saying a space and time-based principal component analysis. Um, and so th the point is uh, it, it takes patterns in a stack, a, a time series stack of imagery, and it says, okay, I'm seeing this pattern in space. This pattern in space is occurring at these time steps. 
how do I backfill? How do I actually interpolate back what I'm seeing from these patterns into something that's realistic, right? Um, and so th this method, I think it was developed like early 2000s. Uh, so it is, uh, I guess, pretty traditional, almost 20 years old. Um, and it's used a lot in ocean studies. Uh, uh, it's used to gap fill clouds. Uh, and so you, we want to have a, a nice clear image of sea surface temperature, of chlorophyll. Those things are very important for climate change applications and also uh, maritime navigation, things like that. So NOAA actually uses this process operationally. Um, I, I, I found this uh, working with one of our customers. and I was like, oh, this is really interesting seeing how NOAA is using it. I'm sure they're running it in their HPC systems. But um, over here on the right, you can see some examples, right? The, those two, the, the left column is uh, examples of observed where you can see the data gaps and on the right are the uh, Dinioff outputs where it's filling in those, those patterns in space and time for sea surface temperature and, and, and chlorophyll. So we're gonna, we're gonna actually do this. What, what are the challenges associated with this, right? This Dinioff process is written in Fortran. Uh, who here's used Fortran before? Okay, so a, a, a few people. Don't worry, we're not doing Fortran coding. We're just going to build the, the code, right? Um, and so there, there's the GitHub repo, if you're interested. Um, it, it's not cloud optimized, right? So if you, uh, anybody familiar with NetCDF data formats? Okay, awesome, more hands. That is not cloud optimized. Don't use that in the cloud. Um, <laughs> spent a lot of time fixing uh, some NetCDF data sets. Uh, and, and the reason for that being is uh, you have to get the whole data, right? You, uh, you want to get small chunks with NetCDF. You don't really have that interactiveness. Um, it's iterative with state. You, you iterate over multiple times uh, trying to fit this uh, interpolation process in, in the D, uh, DINEOF process. So it's interpolating. The, the next step depends on what's happening at, at this step. And so uh, that doesn't fit within Earth Engine, right? Uh, the other thing is it's single threaded. So if you're working like HPC systems, you know, it's working on like a single thing. It, it does that single thing and it does it uh, synchronously, right? You can't really parallelize how it's doing the process uh, very easily, right? Plus, we don't, we don't want to do any uh, editing to Fortran code. So we're not going to try and implement like MPI or something with that. Um, it does have a CLI. Uh, and so you define a, a configuration file and, uh, and trigger that, right? Uh, so some, those are the challenges, but how does this actually look, look with uh, using Earth Engine? And don't worry, you're not going to be doing a lot of coding. Uh, we've kind of prepped how to do that. Uh, most of what you're going to be doing with this hands-on exercise, and we can dive into code and I could show you uh, what all is happening. Uh, but, but the hands-on exercise here is really focused on like, okay, we have our code set up. Let's build the, func let's build the container. Let's deploy the container. How does the, like the containers pulling data from Earth Engine, doing that Dini off process, outputting cloud storage or cloud optimized geotiffs, putting them in Earth Engine, we can visualize those kind of things, right? So it's, it, it's doing this process of using Earth Engine, getting the data out of Earth Engine in an efficient manner, doing what we need to do and putting it back into Earth Engine so we can actually do what we want to do with it. All right, so now we're going to any, before we go into the labs, are there any questions on what we covered uh, about uh, cloud or um, how Earth Engine fits with some of these cloud things, the patterns that you want to do? Okay, we've got a question. Uh, when, you're, when you're asking questions, if you can wait for a second for a microphone because these are being recorded. Uh, do these general rules, like not being able to process with NetCDFs and such, do those apply also to like the Compute Engine and the Kubernetes Engine, or is this just for Earth Engine? Like it's totally separate with different. It, it isn't tools. so much. Yeah, it's not so much that they they can't be done. It's that they're not. They're 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 the unit of the file unit is it has to be parsed like yeah. in its entirely. So, so you you when you when when something's cloud optimized. It's it's built to be split into smaller pieces, right? So that we can we can assign more discrete pieces of work to lots of other so, little workers, right? So yeah. So the exam, like to Jeremy's point, you could still use them, but the you, if you're using NetCDF, the cloud optimized version would be Czar. Um, if, if you've heard of that, it, it's upcoming as a new standard uh, in terms of uh, data formats in the cloud. 
But the point is here is if you have 10 workers and you want to parallelize your process across 10 workers, you would have to copy that one file, that NetCDF file across all those workers, figure out what small chunk you want to do, do that small chunk, and then put that, you know, write some result, right? With these cloud optimized formats, what Jeremy was saying, that they're, they're, they're organized in small chunks. So you have these 10 workers, you're not having to copy the entire file over, you're just copying over that small chunk that that worker is responsible for. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, it helps you scale uh, a lot quicker instead of waiting for some data transfers and things like that. Yeah, it, lets, it also lets you keep the, the amount of data moving back and forth for any given process small so that the latencies can be lower. It just, um, you don't have to have as many big pipes involved. So like the, the, the formats, the czar is like upcoming one for n-dimensional data. Um, the, 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 probably the, I wouldn't, I guess it's a standard, but cloud optimized. It is a standard. Cloud optimized geotiff. There's different ways to kind of implement it, but yeah. that, that built on the, the capabilities in cloud storage that were really originally there for serving videos. So video files are giant, right? And when you play a video, you don't want to download the entire thing, play it, right? That's, you want to be able to start it and just get the piece that you're watching. And so they developed something called an HTTP range request, which lets you pull just a piece of that video out of this giant file that's stored in, um, in the service. Something you couldn't really do with a FTP server, right? You would just stream the whole thing locally and, and park it there and then play it. Um, but you really needed to have that for services like YouTube, right? So that people could hit the pause button um, and, uh, and, and pick up where they left off or jump into it. When, uh, for, for, for spatial data, we, we recognized that um, you, could, you could create a little index at the beginning of a file and use that to tell software where to find pixels in the file. Like, you can think of a file as just one long list of, 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 of information, right? And when it, when it turns into something spatial, it's, it's wrapping lines, you know, for a, but those HTTP range requests meant that, that you could read this little index and then you could say, okay, I only need the pixels in this corner over here. So this is the range to read. Um, and that's what we mean by cloud optimized. So they're trying to implement that in lots of other formats. Beyond pixel data, um, czar is one. Geoparquet is another one that yeah, I think for that's for tabular data. But tabular ho data. hopefully that helps answer your question. I know we kind of yeah, no, it does. I, I think it was largely focused on like the net CDF part, but I was more asking just about like if the approach to using uh, Earth Engine for your workflow, like if the approach is the same if you wanted to use like Kubernetes or the Compute Engine. But I think maybe my question. Will Those be are th that's that's for when you want to. We're gonna we're starting a little smaller here, yeah. like a single container. Uh, what, Kubernetes what, and compute and the Kubernetes is a way to orchestrate yeah. lots of maybe, containers. Maybe we can talk afterwards because yeah. I think it. I think that deserves a little bit more <laughs> than what we have time for. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions before we dive into stuff? Okay. Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, so you mentioned uh, with the NetCDF example and the Dinioff example why that would not be very cloud optimized. And I was wondering if you could share some other examples of maybe file formats or languages or just qualities of one's analysis to help me determine is this good for the cloud or bad for the cloud? Yeah. Um, to, to clarify, there's a lot of ways to do things in cloud. Um, uh, you, you can actually set up an HPC cluster in the cloud. So you can literally, if, if you want to run whatever you're running, keep everything the same, just spin all that up and, and run it. Um, what, I, what I should have said, this is mostly talking about Earth Engine and, and geospatial stuff, right? This, this isn't to say like NetCDF. You can write anything, any, any language, fair game, right? Especially with containerization, right? You just build that and the container, it, it's available, right? Um, there are more or less standards around data. Uh, when I think of data, it's like Parquet is for tabular data, like 1D. G Cloud optimized GeoTIFFs for 2D. Um, or sorry, ZAR for multi-dimensional. And those, uh, 
there's a lot more to that. Um, but like in, in my mind, that's how I simplify things uh, in, in terms of data structures and, and what can be optimized uh, for, for cloud. Um, and then so the, the patterns with cloud are really about uh, what, what Jeremy was saying is, is having a discrete function or discrete way that you want to do something. And it takes a small input, produces that output. And you are then able to say, you, you basically wrap how you're reading your data or getting your data. It gives it into that very discrete function. And then you're piecing all, everything back together, right? That, that, that's, that's essentially how Earth Engine works in the back end uh, as well. So you have uh, what's called pure functions, take an input, do that process, don't change anything, output what, from that process, and then keep moving on. Uh, and then once you're able to do that, that can be scaled across multiple workers because you're not having to ro rely on what's going on within across different things. Yeah, and, and if each of those units of work don't need to know about a lot what's happening in the other units of work, that's that's a more that's generally the best yeah. situation. Um, I guess the other things to think about if you're bringing something into the cloud are, you know, where does it need to ultimately land and, and how can it be accessed, right? So egress is a, is a thing. And so if you're, um, if you're, if you're going to be pulling it out of the cloud at scale, that can be expensive. Yeah. And so you want to minimize the amount of data flow between systems if you can. And, and just to clarify on, on your question for, for this specific process, right? Well, we have we have this flavor of Earth Engine, right? Like I said, there's a lot of different ways to do things uh, with cloud, um, and so uh, looking specifically in this D DIN EOF execution part, that is that there, there's a lot happening in there, but the function really is uh, I, I say function like I mean the process really is like I take this input, my inputs for the Dinioff, do my Dinioff process, output something, and put it in cloud storage because Dinioff outputs NetCDF, then we're going to have something that it inputs NetCDF, so we're streaming data from Earth Engine, getting it into NetCDF, doing the process, outputting it as NetCDF, converting it. So um, you could package a lot into like a, a function, um, but you just kind of like keep your process more discrete. Generally, the bigger, the more you stuff into a function, the harder it will get. Right? You, yeah, you're, 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 there's a there's a there's a spectrum of you know, cloud optimized to not, and that's that's what we're we're, yeah. we're, we're left. Let's get into the thing. Let's do the thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, just just prepping you right at, at the end of this lab. Hopefully, you should have you should be able to create these animations, right? Where on the left here is the raw sea surface temperature. Um, I, I saw something in the news uh, during um, when, when we were planning these sessions. I saw something in the news about you know the coral reefs in the in Florida were burning, and so I was like, oh, sea surface temperature. Um, so that's why it's sea surface temperature. Um, but on, on the right there, you can see the, the gap filled, uh, and so that that's kind of the result of this. Um, who, everybody was able to go to do the survey. And then go to ce.quicklabs.com and, and register with their email. Who 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 hasn't done that? Yeah. Okay. So we can get some help to do that. No problem. Um, if you actually want to dive into the code and, and see how it all works, the the nuts and bolts. I've also uh, given the uh, GitHub repository, so you can pull that. Um, but let's let's just move into the code here. So um, when you when you log into uh, ce.quicklabs.com, uh, you'll see this uh, front end page. I did not register myself as a student, so I don't see, I probably don't see what you're seeing. Uh, if you can give me one second here. I'm going to add myself. Okay, so if you go back to the home page, and it seems like a lot of people were registered, um, you should have this Earth Science Applications 
right here. I have a little bit more, sorry. Um, I just don't finish my labs. Um, yeah, so you should have this Earth Science Applications tab. If you click into this, you'll see uh, a couple things. Um, there should be an Earth Engine 101 and Species Distribution Modeling with Earth Engine. Don't mind those, we're not gonna talk about those. Um, if you're interested, come see us afterwards, we can, we can share those. Um, but we're gonna go into this bringing traditional on-prem workflows and, and into the cloud and Earth Engine. Uh, was everybody able to navigate to there successfully? Okay, awesome. So, uh, you know, before we get started, I, I just wanna do a quick navigation here. So this is a uh, platform that we have at Google that will spin up uh, cloud resources. It will give you a student account and also a cloud uh, project. And uh, essentially, this, this helps in, in these trainings because you know everybody would have had to come with a cloud project and billing and stuff, and this just eliminates all of that, right? Uh, so we want you to be able to have access to the lab without having to uh, give us your credit cards. So when you, when you go up here, if you click Start Lab, um, what that will do is spin up your uh, student account and your uh, cloud project. Uh, quick tip on this, and the, these instructions are in here as well, right? So you, you can, uh, the, the lab will be open uh, for the rest of the week. Unfortunately, uh, with, we have some restrictions on, on our end with uh, providing these resources for free outside of trainings. So um, for the general public after this, you know, after the uh, summit, it, it won't be open, but you can always contact us and we can provide uh, information. Uh, so when you go here, um, click on this open console and just copy the link. The best thing that you're gonna do is use a guest profile. So if you go up here and you're using Chrome, click on your little face icon and go to guest. Yeah, but I, I like the guest profiles because it doesn't mix my account with the student account, right? So I'm gonna go in there and say log in and it should populate and prompt you to log in. So I'm going to do that and say next. And you will be given a password over here on the top left of your, uh, in, in the Quick Labs. So just copy that password and paste it. And then click next. Was everybody able to do that all right? Cool, I see some shaking heads no. Uh, can we get some, uh, Ben, I think he needs some help over there. If you need help, just raise your hand and someone's gonna come help out. So once you do that, um, it'll prompt, this is, it'll say it's, this is a new account, just say I understand. Um, and then it will send you to our Google Cloud Console and then it'll say, uh, sign the terms of agreements and just say, I agree to the terms and, and continue. So I'm gonna pause there and make sure everybody gets to this uh, Google Cloud console uh, because the next thing that we're gonna do is actually register our project to use with Earth Engine. Is everybody, who, who else needs some help here? We can get you up to speed. Everybody okay? Going once, going twice. All right, we are going to move on. The next step that we're gonna do is uh, register our student cloud project with Earth Engine. Uh, if you're not doing this already, you should be using a cloud project uh, with Earth Engine. Uh, what, what this does is it, you know, on the back end, it. it it's a better way of managing than using individual accounts. Uh, so the way to do this, we have a self-service flow. So in the Quick Labs, there is this, can everybody see this all right? Should I, should I blow this up a bit? Is this big enough? See, okay, cool. Uh, so copy this link, it should be code.earthengine.google.com forward slash register. And if you go to here, uh, it'll ask you to sign in. Click on your student account, and then it'll, you'll be on this getting started page with Earth Engine. 
So we're going to say we want to register this project. Uh, for this use case, we're going to select, select unpaid, and the project type will be trainer trainee. Uh, if you are using Earth Engine for uh, commercial or operational workflows and you're going home and, and registering your Earth Engine project, uh, make sure to click the paid usage. Uh, and we're happy to talk to you if you have any questions on that. Uh, but right now we're doing unpaid usage. Uh, so we're going to select next. And then we're going to choose an existing cloud project. And in the drop down, you'll have, you'll have two options. But use the one that has a bunch of random numbers at the end. Don't, do not use Quick Lab resources. If you use Quick Lab resources, it will tell you, uh uh uh, you can't do that. I don't, I don't know if the guy from Jurassic Park does it or not, but uh, it'd be funny if it did. Was there a question, John? Oh, okay. Um, so once, once you do that, just click uh, continue, or sorry, uh, continue to summary. Uh, it's just checking and validating that everything's good and you have the right permissions. And once this is up, click confirm. And then once that happens, it should redirect you to the code editor. Was everybody able to successfully register their project? Woohoo! Awesome, congrats. Was that on the, which? Is he signed in with the student account? Interesting. Okay, we've got one, sorry. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, we're gonna continue moving on. We've got about 15 minutes here. Um, so once, once you've registered your Earth Engine account, that's just saying like the API is enabled and you can submit uh, requests to Earth Engine, things like that, right? Uh, so the next thing that we're gonna do is start, it, there's a lot of copy and paste of code, right? But we wanna, so you can probably go through and copy and paste stuff, but um, you know, let's walk through it. So on the top here, you're gonna wanna activate your Cloud Shell. Uh, this is a free resource uh, to everyone that uses Google Cloud. It's just a VM that you can then uh, do uh, gcloud commands and interact with cloud um, without, it, it, it's a free resource uh, to, to interact with cloud, right? Uh, so the first thing that we're gonna do is actually set up our cloud project to, um, you know, to work with things, right? So we, we're, we're gonna set environmental variables, what is our project, what is our service account that we're gonna use, things like that. Uh, so that's, that's the first uh, bit here. So it's uh, task two, uh, bullet two. So you just copy this point here, this little copy paste is your friend. Uh, I don't know why it keeps doing that. I'm gonna close this. And then just paste that into the uh, Cloud Shell editor. It's gonna ask you to authorize. Uh, just click authorize, it's saying you're gonna use that account. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna enable Cloud Run service on this cloud environment. So to do that, you do uh, gcloud services enable run API, and then we're gonna configure our, our region that we're running Cloud Run in as the same region that we set uh, as an environmental variable. Should note that we're doing this all via the command line interface for gcloud but all these things that you're doing right now have like GUIs in the, um, so if you were to go into the search bar there and you were to look for the certain, the different serv services, you could set the same things, but yeah. we just packaged it up for this exercise so that people can zip along a lot faster and not have to hunt around, but um, yeah. encourage you to explore that environment more when, um, when the lab's over. Yeah. Okay. The next thing that we're gonna do in terms of setup is create a service account. A service account is a, uh, we also call it robot account. Um, it's a specific account that uh, interacts w between services, right? Uh, so this would be something that's run, that's Cloud Run has that is enabled and authorized to write data to cloud storage, send to Earth Engine requests, things like that, right? So we have to set specific roles to a, uh, a service account. 
Uh, and the reason for that being too is like as a user, if you submit a job at Cloud Run, it's going off and doing its thing. You cannot authorize as a user, right? So you need these service accounts. Uh, the other thing is there you'll also maybe hear like a default compute credentials. So every time you spin up a VM in Google Cloud, there's a default compute service account. Do not just add every role to that. That is very bad practice in terms of security. So if you have a very specific thing that you need to do, in this case, like our cloud run functions, calling Earth Engine and writing data, it is only authorized to do that specific thing, right? And it's not going off to Vertex AI and running up a large bill. So, so having service accounts for specific applications or functions uh, is, is good security practice. Okay. Uh, So the next thing that we're going to do is create an uh, artifact registry. Uh, in, in Google Cloud, uh, you store you can st store Docker containers. Who who here has used Docker containers before? Okay, good amount, awesome. Uh, so you can you can build and store Docker containers uh, in a service we call Artifact Registry, and what it will do is give you a um, a st basically a repository where your Docker container and all that is there, and then you can use that within uh, other Google Cloud services. Uh, so we enabled that. Um, I just want to show you real quick. Um, all this up till now, it's just been like turning on APIs and stuff. Uh, now we actually did something. So I just want to show into Artifact Registry. Um, I use the search bar so much. Uh, that, that's really handy if you just search art and then it will be this artifact registry. We can see here that we have this DIN EOF process uh, repository, but it's empty, right? Uh, the other thing that we're going to do is create a cloud bucket to, for our data to land. Uh, so we're just going to use uh, GSUtils and create a cloud bucket in the region that we're working in. Uh, and you can see here that it created our, our bucket. Okay, everybody smooth sailing? Hopefully, everybody following along? Okay. Um, the next thing that we're gonna do is clone the GitHub repository and, and, and build the Docker container, right? So if we wanna just copy and paste that, uh, it, it's gonna pull that repo and inside the repo, uh, maybe I can show real quick over here. Uh, this is a public repo, um, so yeah, so in here is this Docker file, and this has the instructions. Uh, you know, it's only 42 lines of code, but it has the instructions to uh, install that uh, DIN EOF and build the Fortran code, uh, and then uh, install a few Python packages, because uh, I like to write everything in Python, and, uh, and that will be that service that we do. Uh, this next line of code, so um, is basically where to build your Docker container. There's a couple different ways to do it, but we're going to use a YAML file, which is uh, essentially a configuration file. And so we're going to, I'm going to show you this this YAML file here. Um, I clicked on this open editor, so you can basically open up a VS Code editor in Cloud Shell as well. Um, so if you go to terminal and editor, it'll switch back between the two. Um, but in here, I just want to show you this cloud build YAML. Um, it, it essentially has the instructions on what to build and where to put it. And so we're just putting in this region and our cloud project because everybody else ha everybody has a different cloud project. Um, so that command just did that for you. Um, and then it, and then it submits the job to cloud build and it's going through and, and going to build the Docker container for you and store that on artifact registry. Uh, this will take a, a minute or two. Uh, any questions while we wait for this to run? Awesome. Well, coming experts in Google Cloud, you can go home and tell your friends, your partners, you know, I'm now a cloud developer. Is, is like what you would do to build up your own environment. Yeah. You're, you're running through that Docker file, installing all the packages and building up the, building the thing. Yeah. So it's almost, yeah, like 
pip installing. This is automating your pip installs and stuff. This can be kind of like a hard thing to get right, getting all the dependencies and sorting out. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and please do not have the expectation that I did this in one go. <laughs> yeah. it, it took a while to tweak everything. Yeah, I was hoping you can elaborate on that process because I've been there myself too, and it is a yeah. lot of trial and error. And especially, you know, there's, uh, I'll be developing code on my own environment, and yep. then, you know, whether it's R or Python or something, and then I go to try to Dockerize it, and it's really hard to replicate that same environment. I was wondering if you have bef best practices for like developing code in the same environment. Yeah. Using Docker. So we have, uh, yeah, you can build locally. Uh, okay. So if you install the Docker uh, uh, runtime and, and everything, you can build it locally. And so if you're able to build it locally, it's going to be the same wherever. Like that, that's the value of Docker, right? Right. Um, if you want to work in a test and kind of iterate for deployment in cloud, yeah. we have this extension for VS Code called Cloud Code. And essentially what you do is you say, here's my cloud project, here's my credentials, things like that, and it'll authorize. Um, the nice thing about this is there's actually emulators. So it will emulate a cloud environment like Cloud Run or something locally. Okay. So you can build and test things. Uh, I don't know if interactively, there's, there's a debugger. Okay. Um, so you can debug things. Um, and, and so that way you're not pushing everything to the cloud uh, you're doing something locally and seeing how it works right. in the cloud environment, uh, what would be the cloud environment, and then once you're happy with it, you can actually push it to the cloud using this uh, extension. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. Did you have a question? Oh. Sorry, really quick. Is that a VS Code extension that you can get like on your local VS Code or only within the cloud cons or cloud shell? It, local, any, any okay. VS Code. Just right. go to the extensions and search cloud code. Sweet, thanks. Okay, um, after that's done, we should see that our Docker, it, it should say status success. And if we go in here and our red artifact registry, uh, actually don't cancel that, just refresh this little page here. Uh, we should see here now that we have a container or an image, sorry, not a container. We have an image that's the Dinioff runner and we have a specific version. Okay, uh, the next thing that we want to do is execute the job, right? So now we have the runner that should handle how we're doing everything. Um, what we're going to do is uh, set up some stuff to execute the job. So now what I want you to do is actually open that editor. So if you go here and click open editor, um, there's this YAML file called job ENVs. So open that up. Why is this not opening up? Let me refresh. Yeah, live demos. Uh, what's nice is if you refresh, it'll load up your uh, session. All right. There we go. Okay, cool. So uh, this, these are basically like command line arguments uh, that you would pass to a CLI, right? But with Cloud Run, you cannot pass a CLI. So what we're going to do is tell the Cloud Run job that here are the environmental variables and within the process we'll parse those environmental variables and pass that to what we're doing, right? So you can see here, you can, you can define the region that you want to work in, uh, start time, end time, what band. Like right now we're working with the MODIS level three ocean products. So we have like sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, things like that. Um, and so let's, let's copy our cloud project. So I'm just gonna click here, uh, you wanna copy the cloud project ID, which should be the same as the name in this case. So I'm going to paste that in line two. And then there's this cloud bucket, which I'm going to go to cloud storage. So if I just search for storage, storage, uh, I'm going to paste this output bucket name, which is this D-I-N-E-O-F and 
should be a random number. Um, in this case, just heads up, you need to have a forward slash at the end of it. Um, so it should look something like this, right? Where you have your DIN EOF out, and then this is actually your cloud, cloud project unique ID. Uh, and then there, your Quick Labs project, right? So this is the unit of work, right? We keep talking about that. This is if you were if you were to scale this out, like we're just doing one unit here. But yep. if you were trying to build a thing that worked over a much larger area, you would this you would you would come up with ways to create many of these or yep. adjust this for each iteration. Yep. And you could do that. Like you can update the job and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so then the next thing that we're going to do is there's this uh, command, and I can talk through what's actually going on here. Oh, clear. Uh, so we're going to paste that command and run it. Uh, so what's actually going on here, so what this is doing is we're saying, G Cloud, Google Cloud, run this process. Here's the image that we want to use, right? And that should be this, uh, you see this DINEOF runner. Uh, you could specify number of retries that you want to do. This is really good for like APIs, uh, if you were like hitting an API or something. Uh, you can specify how many CPUs, uh, the memory that you want, uh, how long it takes to task the timeout. Uh, we're using Cloud Run Jobs. Uh, Cloud Run Jobs are batch processing environment for Cloud Run. Uh, Cloud Run also has services where you can deploy like a, um, a web service or th something like that where it's invoked by an HTTP request. In this case, we are submitting a batch job. Um, and so that, that batch job can live up to 24 hours. And so you can have a pretty long running process that you want to do and run that in this batch job environment uh, using containers. Uh, but right now, this should actually run for about 15 minutes. I know we're kind of at time here. Uh, I was hoping we had a little bit of time to you know, get through and, and visualize, but um, you're basically saying uh, the task timeout, we're also giving it the service account that we created. And then here's where we're giving that environmental variables job ENV, right? Uh, so we're gonna wait for that to run. It takes a little bit to spin up. Uh, so here's our cloud run, um, here's our cloud run page. And if you, first off, you'll see it's services. If you go to jobs, you should see now your process in there and, and, it's, and it's running, right? And so it'll take some time to complete. Um, this is where Jeremy was saying, you, this is a unit of work and you can paralyze it. And so you can specify within a job, you can specify multiple tasks. So if I wanted to do this over a large area, I would say, here's my big region. And within each task, it would do uh, work an individual chunk or something like that, right? Uh, so there's a lot of ways to, uh, configure things. And that's so, where you'd want to do some math because yeah. if you make your chunks very small and you let this thing scale out to thousands and thousands of, of, of chunks of work, uh, you could hit those earth engine limits and then end up with runners that are waiting and spending money. Yeah. So. Um, but I, we're, we're just at time, uh, Sorry that that couldn't be finished, but this this stays open for this like, will be open for the week. So you can go back in with that uh, with your account, uh, try it out. Uh, it takes we have a limit of an hour and thirty minutes on there. Uh, you saw we got through most of it in thirty minutes. Uh, so once it's done, uh, there's a little bit other instruction. So it brings it back to Earth Engine, and you should be able to make these these gifts. Um, so thank you very much for your attention.